Hello, today we will discuss a bit of history of crystallography. We have discussed many crystallographic concepts and now we will take up the next step to go to the determination of crystal structure. In between, I wanted to share some of the history of crystallography with you. So, let us look at this beautiful snowflake. Mm, this snowflake has nice hexagonal symmetry and it has been shaped by the hands of nature. There is no human intervention in making the snowflake nice and symmetrical. It has an inherent six fold symmetry and beautiful shapes simply fall from the sky. Although this has been made in a laboratory, you can visit the website. Let us look at another example of a naturally grown crystal and this is rock salt and you can see nice well defined facets which are meeting at 90 degree to each other. So, this shape again is not machined in any workshop, but has been designed by nature like this. So, natural growth of crystalline material themselves lend them to nice external shape. This was observed by ancient men and was contrasted by another materials, other types of material like glass. You can see here is a uh, glass which again is from nature, but this does not have any such nice regular feature which we saw uh, for snowflake or for the rock salt. So, based on this a classification scheme was developed and materials were classified as crystalline or amorphous. So, those materials which had which has re regular external shape as a result of their natural growth and you do not have to externally design or shape them, they were called crystalline and other kind of material which do not have this natural shape were termed as amorphous. So, all solids were classified as either crystalline and amorphous and the definition of the crystal was based on the regular external shape. Of course, the curious mind to the curious mind this definition and this distinction raised a question that why, why certain kind of materials, why crystals have this regular external shape. This question was addressed and attracted at this question was uh, attracted attention of many great minds in the history of science. One of them was Johannes Kepler. We know we are familiar with Kepler's laws of motion. The same Kepler was also interested in the hexagonal symmetry or the six fold symmetry of snowflake, which we have just seen. And as a new year gift to his patron, which was one of the barons uh, of his place, um, you know nowadays if we want our research to be funded, we apply to government bodies or to private agencies. In those days, it was individuals, the private individuals who supported research um, of individuals. So, Johannes Kepler had a patron and as a gift to his patron, as a mark of gratitude for all his uh, support uh, to his research, he wrote a um, article or a pamphlet on six cornered snowflake. So, this was a new year gift, a nice new year gift to receive not a card, but a whole research pamphlet. So, this is the cover page of that pamphlet. It is more commonly known as the, the Neve Sexangula, the six cornered snowflake. Let us look at one of the inside pages. This is one of the pages from his book and here he is trying to show packing of spheres and he is trying to show this packing of a sphere to model the hexagonal symmetry of snowflake. Essentially what he is trying to drive at is the external shape, external symmetry of snowflakes is coming because of internal packing, regular packing of some internal units. Remember this is 1611, the atoms were not yet invented. Still, Kepler was able to think that material is built up of some internal units 
and those internal units which he is modeling as spheres like we model atoms today as spheres. So, that those spheres should be packed if they pack nicely. So, what he is showing that a single sphere is there as A and if, if you start packing it nicely and closely then you can have a nice external triangular shape by the regular packing of these spheres. So, the external shape is because of the internal um, arrangement or internal regularity of the units which are packing. Another great mind which also addressed this question was Robert Hooke. We all know Robert Hooke through his Hooke's law, but Robert Hooke was also father of modern optical microscopy as used in science. So, in material science he, he is one of the original uh, material scientist using a microscope. So, this is a book which he wrote in 1667 called Micrographia. So, philosophical descriptions of minute bodies made by magnifying glasses. Here is a page from Hooke's Micrographia. Again you can see he is working at some crystals and looking at their external shape and he is trying to generate those external shape again by packing of his spheres. So, he is trying to show that same spheres if they are packed differently can generate various different external shapes. So, if we take, take their observation we have the first postulate of uh, crystal structure that the regular external shapes of the crystal is due to regular internal arrangement of their building blocks. I am still calling it building block to be uh, to be with the uh, Kepler and Hooke because atoms were yet to be invented or thought of. Now, there was a huge gap 1667 uh, Robert Hooke's Micrographia and 1895. So, there were several hundred years mm, mm, gap before Wil Wilhelm Rontgen discovered x-rays. That was also an accidental discovery. It is a very interesting story that how uh, the photographic plates which were totally covered in black paper were getting darkened without any exposure to light, because in his equipment x-rays were getting generated and those x-rays were penetrating through the paper and exposing the photographic film. So, this accidental or serendipitous discovery led to the discovery of x-rays and he was the first person to be awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1901. The x-ray of course, gave a nice medical tool uh, to the people immediately after its discovery and this potential was realized by Rontgen himself. Here he has uh, shown, um, uh, he has taken a picture of his wife's hand. We are all familiar with this kind of x-ray images these days and there is a probably an engagement ring in wife's hand also. Now, with this discovery, discovery of x-ray, one question came which I am now labeling as question 2. Remember the question 1 was why crystals have nice external shape and now after discovery of x-rays, the second question was are x-rays waves or particles. In fact, the very naming x was because this nature was unknown x stands for the unknown quantity. So, are x-rays waves or particles? This was an important scientific question soon after the discovery of x-rays towards the end of uh, 19th century and beginning of 20th century. Max von Lawe then came into the picture and he postulated that if crystals are periodic arrangement of atoms remember Hooke and uh, Kepler and others have already postulated that, that their crystals external shape is because of regular arrangement of internal building blocks and now people were started thinking of atoms also. So, it started becoming that there is a re regular internal arrangement of atoms which give the crystal nice shape. 
So, this postulate was already there and also now there was another tool that x-rays and there was a question that whether x-rays are waves or particles. So, Lave put these two things together and he made a postulate that if crystals are periodic arrangement of atoms and if x-rays are waves, then crystals also should act as a 3D diffraction grating for x-rays. So, there should be a diffraction, crystals should diffract x-rays. This was the conclusion or the thought conclusion of uh, Lave. Following Lave's suggestion, experiment was performed by Friedrich and Nipping and in 1912, they could see a x-ray photograph from various crystals. This is an example here from one of his early uh, publications, which shows x-ray diffraction photograph from zinc blend. Zinc blend is a crystalline material and if there was no diffraction, one would get only a spot in the center of the photograph. Because of the diffraction, the beams travel in different direction and you get other spots. And if one sees it carefully, one can also see that these spots are arranged in a nice fourfold symmetry. It turns out that x-ray was passing through the fourfold axis of zinc blend, which is a cubic crystalline material. So, of course, all these were not known. This was the first x-ray photograph and because of the diffraction was there, Lave could conclude that x-ray is waves and zinc blend is crystalline. Zinc blend not, not only crystalline has arrangement, uh, atomic arrangement inside it, regular atomic arrangement, periodic atomic arrangement inside the crystal. So, this was a great success and this experiment is considered to be one of the great experiments of science because through one experiment, experiment both questions, both big questions were answered that x-rays are waves and crystals are periodic arrangement of atoms. In any list of great scientific discoveries of 20th century, this is always listed. Here is an example, there is a book uh, landmark experiments in 20th century physics and in this book, the very first landmark chapter 1 is the wave nature of x-rays. So, with this uh, discovery of x-rays, we had a crystallographic revolution, the revolution in the sense that the definition of the crystal got revised. What, what was being considered uh, as crystalline based on the external shape, now the focus turned inwards and external shape was no more important, what was important was the periodic arrangement of atoms inside. So, even if external shape is irregular, we will call the material crystalline if it is periodic in terms of the arrangement of atoms. So, this was a big revolution and a big jump from uh, going from definition 1 to definition 2. So, x-rays, x-ray diffraction in particular brought this crystallographic re revolution and also put in the hands of crystallographer a very important tool to investigate the structure of x-rays. This tool was used by Bragg's to solve the crystal structure 